Hey everyone, I'm here with a quick story. It is on Diddy. Um, there is this, was, let me just get her name so I won't um, mispronounce her name or say her name wrong. I know her first name is Danielle. I want to say, um, what is her last name? Well, her name is Danielle. We'll stick with Danielle for right now because I'm going to go into the whole story. And if you join me on my live tonight, this was part of my live, this particular story. And this is yet again, unfortunately, another one of Diddy's victims. A young lady that is selling a Diddy story. She knew Diddy for years and there was a professional situation between these two. She said that haunted her to the point where she felt like her brain was broken because she just could not remember all the details of the story. She just remembered it happened and she had other professionals that were working with her and Vibe Magazine at the time that reminded her exactly what happened between her and Diddy on that unfaithful day. And so she said, you know, as these stories come out about Diddy, it's, you know, haunting her that she even just, you know, was in pictures with this person that did such horrible things to other people. And I guess in some way, shape or form was fortunate that she did not um, uh, endure any um, SA by him, but she did endure a scary professional um, situation with him. So it's titled, I Knew Diddy. This is from the New York Times. I knew Diddy for years. What I now remember haunts me, okay? So a thing happened between Sean Cones and me, unlike what he has been accused of over the last eight months, which occurred between us, was not sexual. It was professional. Demonstrative of the way um, dynamic and dominary dominary men move in our heyday. Combs and I worked together a lot um, competed in our way. So often I thought I came out on top. I was mistaken. I had reason to fear my life. What happened was insidious. It broke my brain. I forgot the worst part of it for 27 years. It was July 1997, the fading smoke of the murders of Tupac Shakur and the notorious B.I.G. I was named editor-in-chief of a music magazine called Vibe, started by Quincy Jones and Time Inc. In 1992, the magazine chronicled Black music um, and culture with rigor and beauty, 10 issues a year for an audience that was relentlessly undeserved. When I took over, we went we thought hip hop might have died with our heroes and we were determined not only to keep it alive, but also to give it um, cultural credit it was due. Hip hop was both um, in morning and in marketing meetings, Combs, Biggie's creative partner and label boss, was the personification of his doctrine. His Bad Boy Records was having a hundred million dollar year, much due to the work of Biggie and Mace, as well as Combs' own debut album, No Way Out, which was anchored by the blockbuster Biggie Tribune, I'll Be Missing You, featuring Faith Evans of the singles, um, It's All About the Benjamins and Been Around the World. Um, function as a score of hip-hop's megawatt moment, its commercial evolution and international expansion, No Way Out, will go on to sell several seven sell over 7 million copies. So I wanted Combs on the cover of Vibes December 1997 slash 1998 double issue, and I wanted him to wear white feathered wings. My point of reference was the poster of Heaven Can Wait, a 1978 film starring Warren Beatty. The movie is about a quarterback who dies before his time and is reincarnated in an idiosyncratic and callous billionaire. Vibe's working cover for Sasha Jenkins' article was The Good, The Bag, and The Puffy. Not so elegant, but it would work if the fashion director, Emil, and I got combs, then known as Puffy or Puff Daddy, to put an angel, put on angel wings. And if you also got a shot that looked even slightly mischievous, which um, mischievous, we could do a split run of the cover with um, heavenly signif signifiers and another with hellish ones. Possible cover line: Bad boy, bad boy. What you gonna do? The photo shoot would take place in Manhattan in September 1997. I probably said hello to Combs at an event. But the shoot was the first time I was um I was around him for extended period. Either it was crowded, a crowded set, or I just felt um claustrophobic. I wore yoga pants and an oversized t-shirt. I remember one I remember wanting to minimize um my bust more than my bra was already doing. I remember um conjoling. 
And I remember knowing that as a black woman, I was in a no-win situation. To fail was to live up to my male boss's low expectations and to succeed was an invite to their resentment. That day, Combs was begrudgingly compliant. Um, We finally got him to shrug on the white feathered wings. He corroborated up up to a point, but eventually his controlling ways took hold. A few days later, Combs wanted to see the Vibe covers before they went to press. It wasn't our policy to show covers before publications. So after I told him no, we heard that he planned to come to our office and force us to show what we chosen and to make us choose something else if he didn't like what he saw. I'm sure I was concerned, but my priority was getting the issue to the printer on time. There was um, there was first... Um, there, there was vague talk about Combs beating a woman at bad boy offices. In 1996, he was found guilty of criminal mischief for threatening a New York Post photographer with a, a pow pow. Um, Combs was also busy denying that he had something to do with the 1996 killing of Tupac Shakur. In September 1997, Combs had a reputation for shaking tables. I reconciled the rumors with his rev- rev- relevance and the math was ugly and simple. I had to have him on the cover. So a few Vibe employees put together a plan to keep me safe if he chose to visit that day. I was in my office on the third floor of a building on the boring corner of Lexington and 32nd Street. A few doors away from me, Vibe's research chief, Ava Chen, was with the managing editor, Jesse Washington, in his office with her um, back to the open door. Jesse looked over her head as if someone was behind her. Jesse stood up. He's six um, foot four, and Ava saw him trying to make himself even taller. As though he were scaring off, she did she she so she turned toward the door and saw Combs with two security dudes. Combs asked, Where's Danielle? The receptionist had already notified other colleagues that Combs had walked into the editorial bullpen as he and two associates looked into various cubicles and offices. My co-workers eased into mine. Paper proofs of the cover story and both the angelic and de- um, devilish covers were on my desk. I grabbed the unruly stack of 11 by 17s. Staff members shuttled me from office to office to the spiral staircase and the alternate second floor elevator bank. I made it to the 32nd between Lexington and 3rd Avenue, crutching the proofs. Jesse eventually came down. He took the pages from me, flagged the taxi, and put me in a yellow cab to um, home to Brooklyn. The next day though, I was right back in the office. My assistant received a call on my line. It's Puffy, she said. I got my mind right and picked up. He was still on message. He wanted to see the covers. I was still on message. It's not what we do. It was then Combs, it was then that Combs told me, as I retold hundreds of times over the years, that he would see me dead in the trunk of a car, not missing a beat. I told him he needed to take that threat back. Take it back, I said, sounding like if I were 10. Take what back? Then with a vile laugh, um, he said some type of explicit you, right? Take it back now, I said. Or I'm calling my lawyer and you're going to jail. He said, I know where you are right now, right on Lexington. I called my personal lawyer. I did not know what he said to Combs. Within two hours, Combs faxed over an apology. One of my male bosses was furious that I had not involved him. Combs had called him to complain that I sicked my lawyer on him as if somehow I I wasn't playing fair. Soon after those medicine encounters, I walked into um, the, um work, I walked into work one morning to find my staff tampering down panic. A couple of servers, which back then were as big as end tables and twice as heavy, had been stolen. And the scuttlebutt was that the theft was an inside job. That someone on Vi's publishing side had let the movers from Bad Boy, um, had let the movers had let in movers from Bad Boy. It was almost time to send pages to the printer, and the whole issue was saved on those servers. All the editorial changes, all the pages with the advertising adjacencies that had been paid for by cli- um, by clients gone. In response to the fact checking increase, Cones versus representatives would not comment on the record for this piece. I will always remember the threatening call I mentioned in my memoir, Shine Bright, though I got wrong the reason for his vexation, um, but I repressed the rest. 
The only reason I knew the details is a chance meeting that I had um, at the McDonald McDowell Artist Residency this May. Ava Chen, who is now an author and a professor of creative nonfiction, was also there. I hadn't seen her in decades. Ava asked me early in the residency if I was ever going to write about Vibe. I said yes, and she said good. Then just before I left, I mentioned that I was writing about Combs and told her that he said he would see me dead in the trunk of a car. In the previous months, accusations of his serial abuse of women, which had been rumored for years, had resurfaced, and I was thinking about our professional relationship with him. I asked her if she remembered the tense situation. Over a turkey club, Ava said, I absolutely remember. She wasn't privy to the phone conversation, but she knew other details. She told me my own story. I don't remember being um, shuttled from office to office. Shuttled is Ava's word. The entire memory had been removed from my mind. Like the service that was stolen from the offices, I wanted someone else to validate the story. So from the rear garden of McDowell's main building, I FaceTimed Jesse Washington, who is now a journalist and a film filmmaker. When he confirmed Ava's recounting, I stared at a long green metal processing. The fact that two people had to tell me a story about myself was mortifying. It made me question my own truths. I was flooded with questions about my own experience of vulnerability, victimhood, ambition, fear, and regret, and what, um, and what all of it means with regard to my professional and personal legacies. Considering this nauseating image of myself running and hiding from cones, of people at work protecting me, I'm sorry, one second, guys. It made me, uh, da, 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 people, um, um, I was flooded with questions about my own experience of vulnerability, victimhood, ambition, fear and regret, and what all of it means with regard to my professional and personal legacies, considering this nauseating image of myself running and hiding from cones, of people at work protecting me, made me confront other things I possibly repressed that feral and fantastic time in my life. To be a powerful woman in the music industry and in the hip hop media specifically exacted a toll I resisted reckoning with. It's so much easier, frankly, to tell other people's stories. As a journalist, I have learned how to get people to recall stuff they would rather forget or keep to themselves. It is an art taught with betrayal, but it's mine. And so here we are. I was thinking in that garden, now I have to remember. I don't recollect exactly how Cones and I left things after he threatened me in 1987, but it was not as though we could stop dealing with each other. Hip hop inching his way toward world domination needed us to keep contributing in our respective ways. On my end, documenting its trajectory and on his, branching out into television, liquor and more. We interacted when necessary. Sometimes in exchange was just us smiling for cameras. Two photos of us, of us stand out to me and mark places where our journeys intersected. There's one from the 1990s in which my hair is in its natural dark brown and I have a navy and tur turquoise flip hoodie. I'm awkward in his embrace, still getting used to being in the limelight. The other is from October 2006. I'm 41 and my new gray cinnamon coated by the celebrity colorist um, Rita Hazan my teeth have been invisalined and my um, glaze is sure. We're posing before a party celebrating both the release of his album, Press Play, and the new issue of Vibe Magazine. Combs is the cover star. I wrote the celebratory article. In 2006 photo, Combs is in a black tuxedo, a black shirt, and sunglasses. In some of the shots from that night, I look discordantly joyful. And others, I looked like I would rather Combs not hold me so closely or kiss me on the cheek. I was a newlywed and also a professional. I had resigned from Vibe in 1999. And when I was rehired in 2006, Combs was among the first people I called to appear on the cover. I did so because I knew the cover would both succeed at the newsstand and reaffirm to my new venture capitalist, Chieftains, that I still have my chops and that my industry relationships were flawless. So in that series of photos, Combs and I are playing the roles of mobile and editor-in-chief, and we're nailing it. I've been thinking about, uh, a lot about those um, two photos lately. 
All of the photos are me and Combs together. It's bizarre to see myself smiling in pictures with someone accused of such heinous crimes. In November 2023, Cassandra Ventura, who performs as Cassie, sued Combs under New York's Adult Survivor Act, claiming that he armed her, abused, and sex trafficked her over the span of a decade. They settled one day after Ventura filed the lawsuit, and the terms of the settlement have not been disclosed. In the ensuing months, Combs has been the subject of seven civil lawsuits. Six of them accused him of SA. The accusation goes far back as 1990. After Ventura filed a lawsuit, Liza Garner accused Combs and R&B singer Aaron Hall of a 1999 R. Shortly after, Joy um, Nickerson Neal accused Combs of drugging her, sexually assaulting her, and recording the assault without her knowledge in 1991. And she was a student at Syracuse University. A Jane Doe filed a suit in December claiming Combs, along with his bad boy Carly, Carly Harvey Bevere, and a third unidentified assailant, Game Arthur, at Daddy's House, a recording studio owned by Combs in 2003. This May, April Lamp Post, um, who was a student at the Fashion Institute of Technology, accused Combs of honoring her three times in 1995 and 1996. That same month, the model Crystal McKinley said that Combs invited her to daddy's house during Men's Fashion Week in 2003 and assaulted her. Combs' lawyer have so far denied the accusation in all but the last three of the last two of these lawsuits. The videographer and producer Rodney Jones, also known as Little Rod, filed a federal lawsuit claiming that Combs has hidden cameras in all of his properties. The individuals were recorded um, without their consent, and that, be and that because of a treasure trove of compromising video, Combs believes he is above the law. Jones also claims that Combs threatened and sexually harassed him. In one instance, he said he woke up dizzy and naked with Combs and two sex workers. In a statement, one of Combs lawyers characterized Jones' accusations as complete lies. Last December, um, Combs took to Instagram writing, I did not do any of the awful things being alleged. I will fight for my name, my family, for the truth. Then on May 17th, a 2016 surveillance video obtained by CNN showed Combs in a white towel attacking Victoria at the Intercontinental Hotel. In the clip, he hits, shoves, and kicks Ventura, who was his girlfriend at the time. He drags her limb body in this video, the body language that makes him so singular as a performer, and a, a bone and a bond vibrant gives him completely away. On May 19, Combs did a 180, seeming to change his course of claim that Ventura's accusations were baseless and outrageous lies. He shared a recorded apology on his Instagram feed. My behavior in that, on that video is inexcusable, he said. I take full responsibilities for my actions in that video. In late June, Combs deleted all of the posts on his Instagram page. In the past times, um, I attended Cone's large music industry parties. In the past times, I attended Cone's large music industry parties in the New York City, the Hamptons, Miami. To be clear, he has never acted in any way sexually inappropriate toward me. I have slammed shots with him at Rockefeller Center in the Rock Nation brunch. Combs is a genius. He is also sincere in his ambition and his his malevolence. In the entertainment industry, none of this makes him unusual. It's shameful and whack for me um, not to have known fully. I consider myself a hard-hitting journalist. At the time, I broke stories about um, predation in the music and business. In 1994, I was in the, I was a music editor at Vibe. The investigative team that I was part of figured out the 27-year-old Art Kelly had married a 15-year-old Aaliyah. We got our hands on the license and the photographer Dana Luxemburg and I chased Kelly to a tour stop in Philly. I wrote the cover story that verified what had only been wild rumors about his sex crimes. It's easy to think of the 90s and aughts as strange time. I couldn't, in the space of the day, be working on an R. Kelly article, editing a piece of hip hop feminism, and then at one of Cone's or most anyone's shindigs, not knowing what was happening in the very next room. All of this has been normal since the um, dawn of pop. 
to report sexual misconduct, whether it was the attorneys or law enforcement or even young supervisor, often meant losing your job, being ostracized or being a girl that just didn't get it or didn't know how to fend for herself. The music industry was and is a mean place. Journalists were being threatened at recording studios and stopped in their own offices. In the spring of 1999, the music executive Steve Stout claimed that Combs and two bodyguards attacked him over the way Combs was depicted in a music video. He said that Combs punched him in the face and hit him in the head with a telephone and champagne bottle. Stout later asked the court to drop the charges after Combs publicly apologized and pleaded guilty to harassment. Not only were many rank and file workers in our business, men and women alike, generally about physical and emotional safety, we were enlisted to boast the egos of the very artists and executives who felt entitled to violate us. We became used to playing the game. We were conditioned to look the other way or when looking at something straight ahead to not see it for what it was or even to unsee it. It's in our 2006 interview, Combs said, somebody gave me multiple choices early on, having a smooth working relationship, having a personal life, or being in the music industry. I chose the music industry. Same, Puff, same. Too many of us did. We would, we would have had thought of ourselves as ambulant or numb then, but that's what we were. A lot of us women wanted our fair shot at winning. There were dues to pay, and we paid daily. There's no party, cooler and more insanely fun than a music industry party, right? The trade salts and sugars is woman and, and devours them like hors d'oeuvres. Our bodies are not our own. Breasts and asses are meant to be squeezed anonymously from behind at crowded bars where real and difficult work is being celebrated. Some girls survive, dried out, or skeleton, are just um, tough. Some women via luck or brilliance are ex exfoliation is sell. Some marry in, others disappear. The business moving it's as a seductive um, breakneck piece spits them out. Many female executives and top creative types started as a standout student, interns, administrators, and receptionists. Um, we communicated in posh ladies' rooms and hip um, restaurants and in nods and fleeting eye contact in office buildings. One intern said she was hesitant to speak to me because the guy downstairs told me you were such a bee and that you hate pretty girls. I was a bee because I had heard that the sales guys were using their offices as late not like no tell motel rooms. The woman remembered that I used to look away from her when she passed me in hallways. It was weird though, she said, because you seem nice. It was weird and I was nice as I could be, when I could be. Ambition in, in, in an industry that pretends sacredly, most um, make monsters of women who wanted to be what was back then called big willies and if an infantism for um, large penises. Um, five honchos organized big willie panel discussions at industry seminars. Then when women artists and executives were working twice as hard for less money and only whispered credit. That um, this when so many wives and girlfriends of male stars succeeded in the music business by formally or informally managing their partners' careers without professional kudos or full payment, even the work of being a muse is usually grimly unprotected. Take Ken Porter, for example. Porter, who died in 2018, was a model and sometimes actor. Combs is the father of three of her children. On a late autumn afternoon in 1998, I visited Porter at Park Avenue apartment in a 12-story limestone building. Combs was in the process of buying that she shared with two uh, um, with her two boy, little boys. Combs was not there that afternoon. I really ended up in Porter's, in Porter's presence. But when I did, her personality seemed a mix of um, female, um, feminine, fatale, um, and mean girl. The mean girl felt few by a broken heart. Porter and I and two other friends eventually went to a busy restaurant for cocktails. Sometime later, Combs came in. He knew all of us at the table, but didn't acknowledge us. He demanded that Porter hand over her baguette purse and turned it upside down. Her belongings splattered on the table along line um, eights and ice um, crumbs. He snatched up 
he snatched up her bank cards to the beat of you ain't you ain't got no business in here. You need to be at home with those kids. Combs yelled something like, get home as best you can. From the sidewalk, I saw a porter being hustled into the limo in which we arrived. One of the friends, more tired than terrified, shot me a look. You good? And they were gone. A woman deserves to be nurtured and taken care of. Combs told me eight years later, for our, 20, our 2006 cover story, Ken taught me that. She taught me how to love. Maybe he learned that. Maybe he didn't. To be honest, pressing him didn't occur to me. I had just laid off almost a dozen good people. This was the beginning of the end of print magazines. And another one of those when I did um, another one of those times when I did what I had to do to keep the magazine alive. It was my job. It was also my job to hear what women were saying, even when they weren't quite saying it. On August 29, 2015, I was in Calvert City, California at Effort Records, annual celebration of its artists. There was a lot of loud um, talking and drinking, and I found myself um, retreating to a cool alcove where the um, wait staff was being um, handed platters of tuna and thong game, um, game spoons and four inch sandals um, Cassie walked over uncharacteristically alone. She and Combs were women to have gotten engaged the year before, but there had been no wedding and I didn't see a ring. She also hadn't released her second album after her smash single, Me and You, went to number three on Billboard's Hot 100 in 2006. Despite being signed to Bad Boy for almost a decade, when I saw her in Calvert City, it was about six months before the assault shown the CNN Intercontinental video. She surprised me when she gracefully um, squatted. Um, so that's where we were eye to eye. Cassie asked how I was. Me, fine lady, how are you? She, how are you doing? Me, doing what? Like, how are you managing? She placidly awaited an answer. I felt myself tremble. Maybe she saw me in a fellow industry um, introvert, someone skilled at the Irish exit. Perhaps she wanted to know how I was still married at the time for 10 years to a man in the music and media industries. But what caused the trouble was the feeling that she had heard from mutual friends that I was SA a decade before by someone we both knew. Because I was, and I was paranoid, and she was still there looking at me I felt that she was trying to send uh, me an extra sensual signal. I gave her a generic, girl, what? I'm fine. We each wanted to say something. It seemed that neither one of uh, neither of us could find the words. At the moment, she rose on those stilettos as if she were barefoot on a soft lawn. She waved goodbye and walked toward the fresh air. Um, they contacted Cassie through her lawyers and she had no comment. There's no safe space for an ambitious woman, not anywhere, and definitely nur in the entertainment business. Men keep it dangerous, so they keep it theirs. Once a media executive bullied me in a bar, and despite my protest, made it clear he was going to walk me to my hotel room. It was obviously it was obvious that he wanted sex, and his posting nostril was resentment about the job I had. He had the focused look of a person who believes you have stolen something from him, and that something is actually you. That happened to me in the mid '90s, but it has been going on in pop music since forever. Louis McKay physically and financially abused Billie Holiday. Ike Turner physically and emotionally abused Tina Turner. Ted White beat Aretha Franklin. Jerry Lee Lewis married his 13-year-old cousin, who, when filing for divorce um, more than a decade later in 1970, claimed that she had been subject to every type of physical and mental abuse imaginable. Both David Ruffin and James Brown beat Tammy Terrell. The convicted killer Phil Spector locked Ronnie Spector in their home. Miles Davis' marriage to funk singer Betty Davis reportedly ended because of what she called his violent temper. Donna Summer was abused by her boyfriend, Peter. Dr. Dre beat the singer Michelle A and the journalist D. Barnes. Chris Brown hit Rihanna. More than a dozen women have accused Russell Simmons of S.A. and in some cases of R. 
all of which he denies. He also denied that he moved to Bali to avoid extradition. L.A. Reid stepped down as chief executive of Epic Records following a 2017 accusation of S.H. by assistant. A lawsuit filed last year accuses him of S.A. and harassment. Tory Lane shot Megan Thee Stallion. Last month, the producer De, um, Diplo was accused of disturbing as images and videos of a woman without her consent. His lawyer casts doubt on the accusation. And then there are the countless women who remain unnamed or choose to be anonymous or decide not to report at all. I know the beats of getting beat. Um, I was um, half raised by an alcoholic father figure and I still don't know how to act. A Vibe staff member told me on her return from interviewing a musician that he assaulted her. I tried to comfort her, but didn't say much that helped. I know I didn't because years later she told me so. I stuttered and stumbled. I had no language to talk about what happened to her because I couldn't even say what happened to me. She was healing. I was still running and reeling from a work-related sexual assault. She and I always keep in touch, though um, through... Um, though in years later, she invited me to a wedding, I couldn't get myself together to attend. Supposedly the big time mental lady, I was embarrassed and guilty and ragged about not being there for her, about um, not being the person I wish I had been there for me. Sometimes the knowledge in another woman's pain forces you to stare deep at your own. So you minimize hers and you minimize yours and you keep it moving. As they say in the books and on t-shirts and in so many rap songs, including Locks and Puffy's 1998 track, Can't Stop, Won't Stop. <sighs> My glory days were infused with crisis. There was the um, not knowing, the wondering, the suspecting, the kind of knowing, the actually knowing, the acting as if you don't know. I had been a fly on the wall and a fly pinned to it. I made a career in the music businesses. I loved it and it almost killed me. It was a lot to hold in my mind at once. The sadness and anxiety pushed me to nicotine and then um, Robotrin. Um, some of my past times, including Combs stalking me at the Vibe office, had um, to be redacted. I blacked them out in order to keep um, the lights on. Some things were recovered. Back in 1997, on the afternoon the service was stolen from the Vibe office, it turned out that our art director had the issue on a disc she had taken home. We were able to publish our angel in double covers of cones. In each, he's looking over the top of dark glasses. In each, he looks as though he could um, continue winning for a long time. The last time I saw cones in person, it was February, 2020 at the house in Los Angeles that was raided in, um, this March by Homeland Security investigators and investigation agents. I was invited to chat about possibly participating in a docu-series that Combs was creating about his site. I hadn't spoken to him in a while. As it was, Combs was fresh off a star-studded 50th birthday party. I was curious about whether such a, a big milestone had triggered in him a desire to tell his true stories. My husband and I, um, put a plan in place. Um, put in place a plan of texting and pin dropping, so I would never be out of touch. There was no way, though, that I wasn't going to go. One, I'm a journalist. I was um, duty bound to my ego, ambition, and expertise. Say it should be me getting the big interviews. There, um, three. There is power in meeting and showing up. If I don't go, I can't take notes and I can't have the experience that becomes mine through writing. A film crew was at Combs' house. He was in a large, um, leg, he was in a leg brace, having just undergone his first surgery in two years, this time to repair a quad tendon tear. Um, this is God's work, he said on the Instagram, to slow me down. His twin daughters, then 13, drifted about, concurrently um, um, blaze and inquisitive. Over a dozen of us sat in a pristine outdoor kitchen watching emotional footage. Combs introduced me to a group as a longtime journalist He asked, who asked real questions. I was surprised when he asked um, me what. Um, when he asked me what, when I eventually interviewed him, I would ask um, him first. I hesitated. He said, don't answer that. People laughed. I remember being glad I was part of such a large and familiar group. 
Um, and even comforted a bit by the um, post-surgical leg brace that Combs appeared to need. I was where I was supposed to be. I've been told since I first started going to shows on my own that it was dangerous, um, that someone was going to arm me or stab me or rob me or steal me. Um, it seemed then like a conspiracy to keep me in the house from becoming myself, from knowing myself as brave. Three weeks later, the COVID lockdowns began in Los Angeles. I didn't end up participating in the documentary. Coles and I traded goodbyes in, in the great room of overwhelmed by pastimes and a huge painting by Kerry James Marshall. The acrylic and um, um, collage work was created in 1997, the unfathomable year that Biggie died. Combs the producer, entrepreneur, emerged as an artist and hip hop changed forever. It's easy to see why Combs would be drawn to such a larger than life depiction of play, freedom from labor, and affluence as ordinary. Um, there's um, water skiing, croquette, golfing, picnic, um, picnic accountment. On the 9.5 by 13 foot canvas are bits of lyrics from the Temptations and Snoop from te from the Temptations and Snoop Dogg. The painted inhabitants wear white, as the Who's Who did for years at Combs gasping in white parties. I attended a few of those. Scanning past times, I could almost smell those old corpse of evaporating sharp champagne. The painting had carried a pre-sale estimate of $8 million to $12 million. Anonymously, Cone's battle bidders as the price rose to a record um, suddenly $21.1 million, widely reported to be the most ever paid for the work of a living Black artist. Sky is the limit, and you know that you can have what you want, be what you want. So goes the bad boy song. Perhaps every bad boy song, sky's the limit, where you're buying a picture in which you see yourself in all your glory. One that seems to float close to your own memory of the way things were. The painting sits in its home on an angelically clean version of a deeply explicit industry. Our past times, unironically nicknamed the golden era of hip hop, are much um, folk tale as fact. The growing set of accusations against Cones have me angrily calling into question the fullness of my own memory and the position of my timeline. I have already lost stretches of my life. So what? In the grand scheme of things, in the afternoon from 1997, actually is everything. I already spent a lot of time playing catch up because I have handed, the, uh, I have handed whole years to depression. I was a bed um, rotter before it was called that. I could barely hear music for the tears in my ears. It's one thing to deal with a brain fog. You guzzle cold water, fish oil, um, and you keep it moving. But I mean to have blocked out a whole series of events is terrifying because what else is missing? What do I not know that I have not seen? What in hip hop have I not heard? I never wanted to believe that music, which saved my life as a child and teenager, reinforced my audacity in my 20s and provided a way for me to make a living in my adulthood could fail me. It is in too many ways my life. I'm the goddamn institutional memory. So it's particularly rats, rancid that this suppressed episode has placed me in a well of self-doubt. Here I am in a familiar victim mode, disciplining myself into not taking on blame, for not knowing what I didn't know and for managing, managing what I did. The questions dripped down on me, slowly, steadily, a torture. Was my magazine too well done and too loud? Should I have even gone to the white parties? They keep, um, they, um, they keep coming. Was my skirt too short? Is it possible that I stayed at a party too long? Whew, she did a lot in this article. Let me say this. Um, sometimes you don't know until you know. And sometimes you don't realize what you endured until you really know better. And, you know, Diddy is one of these things where um, he was the in crowd. He was the man. Everybody, everybody wanted an invitation to his parties. There was a lot of people at these parties. There was a lot of people that know what he did. They tolerated it. They endured it. And they figured they had to do it 
in the name of their career. But on the flip side of that, there are a ton of people whose lives were destroyed, destroyed by this man. And one thing, um, everything with Diddy is alleged. One thing I just never understand with individuals, I don't see what anyone can ever get out of taking advantage of a person sexually. Like what satisfaction do you get out of that? Um, and I feel like it would be better satisfaction if you are doing something with someone who wants to do that back with you, but to just take advantage of them. I don't know. It's just so crazy to me. The more stories I hear about Diddy, I think we're all getting desensitized to them, but I still can't believe like they all just seem so unbelievable that one person could be capable of doing so many um, hideous things. Anyway, guys, chat with me in the comments. And when I get an opportunity, I will chat back. I don't know, know if I want to say she's fortunate because um, it's like trauma is trauma. But I guess in some ways, she's a little bit more fortunate than the others because she didn't have that you know, essay trauma by him, but she did have an essay trauma through someone else. I, I just think this industry is dark and something needs to be done like immediately. Anyway, guys, chat with me in the comments. And when I get an opportunity, I will chat back. If you're not a subscriber, subscribe, hit the notification bell so that every time I upload a video, you will be notified. If you are a subscriber, welcome back. Everybody, thanks for watching. Hit the like button, guys. Um, Chat with me. And I will chat back and I'll see you in the next video.